Tonight I will be reading Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good things does he withhold from those who walk with whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. The word of the Lord. Good evening, and welcome as we gather to worship our God. I'm Pastor Stephen Weinja from the Pipestone Christian Reformed Church. Um, probably most of you know who I am, but uh, it's good to be with you and worship with you this evening. Let's now go before the Lord in silent prayer as we ask for God's blessing on the service. Let's stand for our opening song, number 243, How Lovely Is Your Dwelling. Now receive God's greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congregation, our help is in the name of the Lord, our God. You may be seated. 
we go before the Lord in our evening congregational prayer. Are there any prayer requests or items of praise that you'd like to share with us tonight? Yes. Yes, uh, we're thankful for the rains that came in our area. They were very much needed. Um, we got about almost three inches in, in the Holland area this last week. Anything else? Yes. Thanks for traveling, Mercies, for the, the serve trip to Montana, you said. Thankful for the Lord watching out when we're on the road and taking care of us. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, we're grateful for a good trip as well on the highway and that everything went well with our daughter's wedding in Washington. Thankful that everything went well with the wedding in Washington and, and safe travels on the road for Chad and his family. Anything else? Let's go before the Lord in our evening prayer. Lord, what a joy it is to gather in your house with your people to close out your day. What a blessing it is that we have this privilege and what a joy it is as the people of God to <coughs> march together forward on the road to Zion. Oh Lord, we come before you thankful that we have the freedom and privilege to gather and worship here. We thank you for this place. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you, oh Lord, for those who serve our church and we give thanks for all those who are here tonight to close out your day. Oh Lord, I pray that you might grant them your grace and your peace and a rich blessing. We thank you, oh Lord, for the devotion of your people to your kingdom. Oh Lord, we know that often our devotion isn't what it should be. We don't love your kingdom and church as we should. We thank you, oh Lord, uh, for your mercies to us. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you continue to renew us and to, to guide us through our lives, through all the challenges of our lives. You have promised to be our God forever. And best of all, you have forgiven for us for our sins. You have granted us a great salvation. And so we rejoice to be here tonight, worshiping and praising you. O oh Lord, we come to you this evening with thanksgiving we thank you, O oh Lord, for the rain upon the, our area here in the last week that was much needed for the crops. We pray that it might continue to be a good season for the crops, that we may praise you for your goodness and your provision for us. We give thanks for the many who have experienced traveling mercies we thank you that uh, the, the serve project that went to Montana had a good trip and a good time serving and helping the people in need there. We thank you for the opportunities, O oh Lord, that we have to um, show your love to other people and to bless other people in the name of Jesus Christ. And we pray, O oh Lord, that this mission um, would, have been, would have shown others the light of Christ and that you will bring a rich reward from it for your kingdom. We also thank you that uh, you were with Pastor Chad and his family and that they had safe travels to uh, Washington and a good wedding there and that you have brought them back safely here uh, with us. Pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to take care of them 
and uh, bless them as well. Oh Lord, we, as we look upon a new week that is upon us, we pray, oh Lord, that you would grant us wisdom for the decisions that need to be made. We pray that you would give us words of grace for those people that we find to be difficult in our lives. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant strength to those who are weak, that you would grant courage and boldness to your people as we live in your salvation. We pray that you would supply all of our needs according to the riches that are ours in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your many blessings to us. Keep us in the coming week and keep our families. Be with those who will be traveling on the road again this coming week and vacationing, and may it be a refreshing time for all. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, be with us in the work that you've given us to do. We thank you for the gift of work and give us the ability to do it well. Be with our members who can't be with us tonight for one reason or another. Be with our shut-in members and our members who live alone, that you would be near to them. Comfort those who are sick and weak and grant them a Sabbath blessing and grant healing to them in their lives according to your good and sovereign will. But even more so, grant us patience and grant us perseverance. And we pray that as your people, we would be able to keep our eyes on the prize that is set before us and that you would give us joy in serving Jesus in this coming week. Bless us, O Lord. Forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing again. Number 280. Number 280. Please turn with me this evening in your Bibles to Psalm 141. Psalm 141. One thing that is unique about this psalm is that it's a prayer all the way through. And if you go through the psalms, you have to be impressed by the fact that David did an awful lot of praying. <laughs> And he expressed his heart, he opened himself up before the Lord in so many different ways. And I think this psalm is kind of interesting in that it reflects David's growing spiritual maturity through the trials he has been through, the experiences that he has had. 
and he comes to the Lord, and in this prayer, I think it teaches us also how to pray before the Lord and encourages us that we should keep praying. Um, too often we have to admit we don't bring everything to the Lord in prayer. We want to handle things according to our own wisdom, or maybe we see prayer as a sign of weakness, but we have a great privilege as God's people. We have access to God himself, and God hears us through Jesus Christ. And David prayed often, we should too. And David turns his eyes toward the Lord in a beautiful and humble way and shows us the heart of the believer. Again, I want to say we aren't saved by our good behavior or our attitudes. We can't be. We look back on our day, and some days we're better than others. But the good news of the gospel is we've already been saved. You do have to be saved by works, just not your works. The works of Jesus have already saved you. You are already redeemed. And so now you can take this and read this as a pattern for your Christian life and ask the Lord to sanctify you in this way, that you might, your life might be changed, not to earn acceptance before God, but in the power of Christ who has already accepted you. In his acceptance, we desire to be increasingly conformed to his image. And so this is a prayer I think we can learn from as well. Psalm 141. O Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Let not my heart be drawn to what is evil, to take part in wicked deeds with men who are evildoers. Let me not eat of their delicacies. Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it. Yet my prayer is ever against the deeds of evildoers. Their rulers will be thrown down from the cliffs, and the wicked will learn that my words were well spoken. They will say, as one plows and breaks up the earth, so our bones have been scattered at the mouth of the grave. But my eyes are fixed on you, O sovereign Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not give me over to death. Keep me from the snares they have laid for me, from the traps set by evildoers. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by in safety. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word to us tonight. Apply it to us by your spirit and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How do you want to be seen by the world? Some people want to be seen as strong or maybe fearless or beautiful, smart or right or a combination of those things. And many spend their lives worrying about how other people see them but what we should all want more than anything else is to be seen as godly people. And this means we don't worry about the expectations of our world. We know we live ultimately before an audience of one, that is the Lord God himself. And as we grow in our Christian walk and look to Jesus, we should become hopefully more invisible to ourselves as we're conformed to his image. And David shows us what that looks like in this prayer. First of all, you must want God's ear. David asked God to hear his prayer. And we see this in the first stanza, verses one and two. In verse one, O Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. Many times in his life, David has had the need to be heard very quickly. And this time is no exception. You know, when your kids or your grandkids come to you, there's often little patience. They say, I need help right now, Daddy. I need help right now, Mommy. You have to help me now. And in one sense, you might say that David's kind of like a big kid. He says, Lord, come quickly. Come right now. Come help me. And here that come quickly is a humble sentiment, I would argue, of David, rather than an insistent demand. He knows that only God can help him. He knows his life is found in the Lord. 
And so this is not impatience on David's part. It's David, David grasping reality and clinging to the Lord. So when your little kids ask you, come quickly, um, we need not immediately be dismissive of that. But see this as beautiful faith and trust. Your parents trust, uh, you, you trust that your parents, you kids here, you trust that your parents can help you. They're the only ones who can help you. They're the only ones who can deliver you. So you say, mommy and daddy, come quickly. And that is what we do with the Lord. It's beautiful faith and trust. We say, come quickly, Lord, and help me. And so this is part of the beautiful heart of faith we see in David. He wants to be heard. He needs to be heard. And we know our prayers are heard through Jesus. Because of Jesus, our prayers are quickly heard by heaven, and God will act. The second thing David wants is for his prayer and worship to be pleasing to the Lord. In verse 2, May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Again, David's desire isn't that his prayer come across as demanding or self-serving, but pleasing to the Lord, like sweet-smelling incense before the Lord. We're studying Revelations in Pipestone, and we see that in Revelations chapter 5, the prayers of the saints come up to the Lord like sweet-smelling incense. That's how the Lord sees your prayers. And we have to understand that. Our prayers go up to God, and they are like sweet-smelling incense. And they are acts of worship before God. David also, you'll note, lifts up his hands to the Lord. You know, sometimes when we pray, we might bow to the Lord. It's also okay to lift up your hands. And David does that. He would have the lifting up of his hands be like the evening sacrifice that closes out the day honoring the Lord pleasing to the Lord. And so we see David's heart here. He wants his prayer to be heard right now, and that is humble faith on his part. And he wants his prayer to be seen favorably by the Lord, and that is what you should want as well. Second, you must desire a pure heart. And we see this in the next stanza, verses 3 to 4. First, he asked the Lord to guard his mouth. Verse 3, Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, Keep watch over the door of my lips. You know, we, we talk about the tongue, and James speaks a lot about the tongue. Um, he speaks about how people can have learned to tame all different kinds of animals, and yet the taming of the tongue is another thing. It is perhaps the hardest thing to train of all. James notes that with our lips we can both bless God and at the same time curse men who are created in the image of God. He also says the tongue can be as a restless poison. We can get into so much trouble. And that includes us, even those who fear the Lord. Uh, we can still get into a plenty of trouble uh, with our tongues. There was a man named Dr. Newton Hall, and he wrote a rather famous book called Come to Jesus. And at one point in his ministry, someone wrote a blistering critique of Dr. Hall and of his ministry. Well, Dr. Hall said, I'm not going to let this go. He wrote a letter to that critic that was full of angry rejoinders and insults. But before he sent the letter, he decided to run it by his friend, the preacher, Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon agreed that it was an accurate letter and that Hall was speaking the truth, but said it was missing one thing. He said, well, well Dr. Hall, you've got to add to the, one thing to the end of this letter. Author of come to Jesus. Well, then the two men kind of looked at each other, and Dr. Hall realized his mistake. He got the point um, and didn't send that letter after all. Any of us can so easily get into trouble. We can proclaim the grace and kindness of God, but the next moment act ungraciously and unkindly. And Hall realized that that is exactly what he was doing, and he even wrote the book, Come to Jesus. Well, David says to the Lord, I need grace. I need help in controlling my tongue. And we all need help with that. We all need grace. And so it's wonderful for us to pray a prayer like this um, with David. Ask the Lord to sanctify your tongue as you begin your day. Ask the Lord to help you use encouraging words with people that will lift people up and help them in their lives. 
Ask for the Lord's grace to do that, and he will give it. Second, David asks for a heart that recognizes and rejects evil. Verse 4, let not my heart be drawn to what is evil, to take part in wicked deeds with men who are evildoers. Let me not eat of their delicacies. And I was thinking of the relevance of this in our social media age. You know, the social media algorithms on Facebook and other places, you know, you get on there to keep up with your friends, but they're also trying to sell you stuff and market you stuff. And if you happen to do a search for something, say you were trying to buy a new cordless drill and you Googled that, and the next thing you do is you go to Facebook and pretty soon on your Facebook feed, what do you see? Well, you see a provocatively dressed woman holding that drill and encouraging you to click here and buy it right now. So these social media algorithms apparently don't care about any sense of morality at all. And uh, we run into that stuff all over the place in the world that we live in today. They don't mind making sinful and shameless appeals uh, to your sinful nature. They know what your heart is drawn to, and they'll sell it to you. The world will help you indulge your sinful flesh in whatever way they can, especially if they make money. You know, we can't always help what we see. We live in a sinful and broken world, and David saw evil And he was confronted with evil. He was tempted by evil. We know that at one point he was tempted by his sinful flesh and gave in to sensual sin with Bathsheba. And what does David know? He knows he needs the grace of God to help him. And that's what he's asking for. He knows evil's out there, but he asked that the Lord would guard his help, his heart not to be drawn to evil and to take part in wicked deeds with men who are evildoers. If everyone around you is doing the same thing, it's easy for you to be drawn into it too. And David knows his weakness. He says, I know I could easily fall for this. I need God's grace. But the good news for us is that God's hand is not shortened. I was talking to some people this afternoon at a a picnic we were at, and they said, well, the good old days, it was easier to raise kids back in those days. Things were so much simpler and so forth. Well, we shouldn't necessarily say that. Because God's hand isn't shortened, that he can't save our children and keep them through this culture we live in today. Um, He is still our God. And what do we need to do? We need to come before him and ask for grace, that we would not be tempted by this evil world. And God will be faithful to us. God is, in his gospel, is able to keep us and our children. The world is always setting its feast before us. It's kind of interesting. David says, let me not eat of their delicacies. It looks good what they put in front of us. They appeal to the flesh. And David says, give me strength to turn the other way. Help me not to partake in it. I am weak. I can't stand on my own. I need your grace. And if we come to the Lord with that attitude, he will certainly answer our prayers because he delights to answer prayers like that. May we also say no to temptation. May our hearts be fixed on the Lord. And may we have pure hearts before the Lord. Well, third, this evening, you must accept rebuke. And what's interesting here is David even goes beyond accepting rebuke. He desires it. He doesn't say it's pleasant to receive rebuke. I mean, I don't think any of us are sanctified enough to say we enjoy being rebuked. But here, in a sense, David welcomes it. In, what, in, in a sense, he says, and I think that's really amazing. He says in verse five, let a righteous man strike me. It's a kindness. We think, well, that's, that's over the top. That's kind of assault and battery, isn't it? Um, but the truth is that some blows can be kind and we're not advocating beating people up here. But what is true is that we should be thankful for any kind of discipline that turns us away from sin. David says, you know, sometimes I need a spanking in some ways still in my life. I need something that really gets my attention so it knocks me off the sinful path that I'm on and turns me in the right direction, even if it's something as extreme as a blow to the body. You know, I thought of Deuteronomy 25 here. When there was a dispute, the guilty party was to be sentenced to a flogging of up to 40 lashes, Um, which was probably more effective punishment than what some of our courts um, issue today. 
uh, sometimes we might need strong medicine for it to go to our heads. If the Lord has given you some strong medicine recently in your life, if he's rebuked you in some way and knocked you off your path, be thankful for it. That is the Lord's grace to you. Um, He cares about you and is lovingly disciplining you. And David continues to speak of the blessing of rebuke. He says, let him rebuke me, it's oil on my head. Again, when he says oil on my head, it's, it's not the sentiment that I have when I'm changing the oil on my car. You're flat on your back in the gravel, you have the socket wrench turning the drain plug, suddenly it lets go, and before you can get your head out of the way, the oil comes down on your head and in your hair, the dirty oil. That David isn't speaking in, in those terms. In the scripture, anointing with oil is associated with the richest blessings of God. Oil was a luxury. You might rub it on your face to make your face shine. In the Middle Eastern sun, maybe you'd put it on your head to keep from getting a sunburn. You are blessed if you were anointed with oil. Psalm 23, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. So this picture of oil being this this luxury So to refuse to listen to rebuke is to refuse the blessing that God pours out upon us. And we need to remember that. I think we we have a hard time with, with rebuke because we still have a heart problem. We think that we we are still trying to justify ourselves by our works, by our behavior. So when our behavior falls short, um we lash out to defend ourselves because we think our identity is at stake. And we don't need to do that. We're already secure in Jesus. Um, We can face our sin. Jesus has already perfectly fulfilled the law for us. We're already justified by grace through faith. And so we shouldn't feel threatened when people rebuke us. We do tend to feel that way, but it's a blessing when people rebuke us. Our life is better for it. And I, as I've gotten older, I, I've increasingly come to, to see that admitting I'm wrong or sometimes being told that I'm wrong has, has a real cleansing effect on my life. Do I always enjoy it? No. But um, it, it really purifies your life. And God uses that for your great good. And it leads to life and to blessing. Well, fourth, you must hate wickedness. And David, in the next stanza, verses 5b to 7, Praise against evildoers. He doesn't want to see evil people succeed. He wants them ruined. And according to scripture, if we have hearts after the Lord, it is not wrong for us to want those who are doing evil actively to be destroyed and to be ruined. And if you pray that way, like in a public space, I can imagine that you'd really raise some eyebrows in our culture today. Some people don't even think there's wickedness. It's just people with different opinions And at one level, uh, calling something wicked is is viewed as as intolerant. Yet we have to resist that. Evil is evil. And David, the man after God's own heart, prays for the destruction of evildoers. He says, Let my prayer, yet my prayer is ever against the deeds of evildoers. Their rulers will be thrown down from the cliffs, and the wicked will learn that my words were well spoken. So David has a heart after God, and that means he hates evildoers. He prays against them. Those who do evil are already, as it were, living on the edge of a cliff, and it isn't difficult for the Lord to throw them down. And also, we can be courageous and bold in asking God to vindicate the true words that we say, and that's what David's doing here. He says, Lord, let them know that I am speaking here the truth. And so we should never be ashamed of speaking God's truth to people either. Um, God will, will bless that. David is really bold here. You know, he's, a, he's humble, and here he is saying, let them see um, that my words were well spoken, that I'm speaking the truth. He wants to see evildoers destroyed. Verse 7, they will say, as one plows and breaks up the earth, so our bones have been scattered at the mouth of the grave. So you have some farming terminology there. Um, David desires to see evildoers broken up, furrowed through, run through the ground, scattered, brought to complete ruin. And this is the desire of those whose hearts are fixed on the Lord. And at this point, you might say, well, didn't Jesus say that we must love our enemies? 
Yes, we must do that too. Jesus told us clearly we must love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us. And I think in our day-to-day relationships with our enemies, that that is exactly what we must do. Um, God wants us to show mercy and pray for those who are our our enemies. And, And David did too. Like in 2 Samuel 16, Shimei cursed David, but David said, well, leave him alone. Maybe the Lord told him to curse me. Maybe the Lord will bless me in some way through his curse. And David showed patience with his enemies. And yet at the same time, it is true that we can pray for the destruction of all God's enemies. Just because the Bible says one thing one place and another a different place doesn't mean they're in contradiction, but that both are true. And we can pray as David did. Finally, we are to take refuge in the Lord. And David turns and prays for God's protection. He prays, But my eyes are fixed on you, O sovereign Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not give me over to death. And really all of this psalm has been about David's fixation on the Lord, and identifying the Lord here as the sovereign God. And as such, the Lord is able to lead us through this life. He takes refuge in God. He asks God not to give him over to death. We know our lives are in God's hands. We know that he controls the future. We live and die according to his will. And we give ourselves to the Lord because we belong to him. He is our faithful savior. But at the same time, it's right to ask God to save us, to deliver us. David's life in so many ways was like living in a minefield. He faced enemies and trouble on his path to the throne. His enemies were out to get him, setting traps for him. But God is in control of these things too. God would have us fix our eyes on the Lord, on himself, just as David did. In his commentary on this passage, James Boyce tells a story from uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. There's a scene where Pilgrim is making his way up a steep path by night toward the porter's lodge. He comes to a place where two lions are chained by the path, one on his right and the other on his left. He doesn't know that they are chained, and he is afraid and about to turn back when the porter calls to him, saying, Fear not the lions, for they are chained and are placed there for trial of faith where it is, and for discovery of those that have none. Keep in the midst of the path, and no hurt shall come unto thee. So Pilgrim presses forward. He keeps on the straight path by fixing his eyes on the porter. He refuses to look at the lions, which are lunging at him from both directions, and he keeps moving forward. And maybe that's kind of the image here that David paints. He's going through these hard times, but he's fixing his eyes on Jesus. He's fixing his eyes on the Lord as he goes through the dangers and the minefields of life. And we are to do the same. God protects his people, and he wants us to fix our eyes on him and pray for that protection. Our prayers matter as part of the life of faith. We ask and we keep receiving all through our lives. That's how we grow in grace. That's how we prevail over all dangers until the day when dangers are no more. So we've looked at this prayer of David. It's this portrait of the heart of a a believer. It illustrates what should be the attitude of our hearts. First, you must want God's ear. You want him to hear you. You can ask him to come quickly. Like one of your children beautifully comes to you and says, mommy, help me quickly. You want your worship and your prayers to be pleasing to him and to ascend like incense to his throne. Second, you desire purity of heart. You don't want anything to get in the way of your walk with the Lord. You want uh, grace to help you control your tongue and resist temptations, the delicacies of the world. Third, you must accept rebuke. If a righteous person strikes you, it's a great blessing If you're rebuked, it's like oil on your head, like being blessed. Fourth, you must hate wickedness. There is right and wrong in a moral world. 
And while we are to love our enemies, we may also pray that evildoers would be destroyed. And of course, all along we take refuge in the Lord and fix our eyes on him and seek his protection. This life that you are in right now is a test of your faith. Many things will try to scare you, but the sovereign Lord is in control. The lions are chained. God is in control even of them, and he will keep you till his work for you is finished. David's greater son, Jesus, is the one who will put all his enemies under your feet, and he has. He's the lamb who has conquered, and you can trust him with your life because you're in Jesus. In him, that you have the victory. May we be those who learn to pray like David because our hearts are changed and belong to Jesus. May we not care how we're perceived by the world, but by the Lord. And may the Lord make our lives beautiful for him and for his kingdom. May the Lord help us. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word to us tonight. We thank you for this prayer of David. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would change in our hearts and continue to conform us to the image of Christ. Forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Our song of response, number 548, let's stand to sing, When We Walk With The Lord. confession review. If you'll turn to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 45, uh, page 916 and 917 in the back of the gray hymnal. Let's, I will ask the question, ask you to join me in the answer. Question 116, why do Christians need to pray? Because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness God requires of us. And also because God gives his grace and Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly, asking God for these gifts 
and thanking him for them. How does God want us to pray so that he will listen to us? First, we must pray from the heart to no other than the one true God who has revealed himself in his word, asking for everything he has commanded us to ask for. Second, we must acknowledge our need and misery, hiding nothing and humble ourselves in his majestic presence. Third, we must rest on this unshakable foundation. Even though we do not deserve it, God will surely listen to our prayer because of Christ our Lord. That is what he has promised in his word. What did God command us to pray for? Everything we need, spiritually and physically, as embraced in the prayer, Christ our Lord himself taught us. What is this prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Close with the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs>